and all of a sudden you found the light switch and you saw the chairs and the table and the microphone and the, uh, the pictures on the walls. The question is, did all those things appear in the room when the light came on? No, they were always there, your light just wasn't on. So in each and every one of our minds, we have all the information that has ever existed, that exists now, and will exist. And that the role of a true educator is not a concept of teaching. The role of a true educator, by the way, let me ask you, because I, I didn't see the camera. Uh, do, do I need the microphone? Because I'll use it if I need to, but I tend to uh, do it. But if you, if you think I need it, let me know, and I'll just pick the microphone. Egg, oh, Edward Bruce Bynum, Dr. Edward Bruce Bynum, and he wrote a book, Dark Light. He also wrote a book before that titled The African Unconscious. Ph phenomenal mind uh, with a, a lot of information. The point I'm trying to make, which I think is more important, is that even if our children are scoring well on these tests, they still are not being educated the way true humans were meant to use their brains. So when I hear someone say, well, my child goes to a school and they're testing well, that does not mean they're intelligent. There is no standardized test that can measure your true intelligence. I've written tests before. I'm, I, I was one of the writers for the sixth grade social studies test for the state of New York. They brought us up to Albany, the capital of New York State, to study how, they call item writers, to learn how to write questions for a test. Very simple. I tell our children, we have to play the game. Play the game. If they want to tell you that you scored well, good, okay, fine. But understand that standardized tests fundamentally only test you on two levels of the capacity to have information. There's a gentleman, Benjamin Bloom, who developed a category of how to categorize information. For those who are in education, it's called Bloom's Taxonomy. The lowest level of knowing something is knowledge. From knowledge then comes comprehension. Comprehension, application, application, analysis, analysis, synthesis, Synthesis evaluation. Those are the levels. Right now, all of you are going through this. I went through this when I was listening to Brother Nate and Brother uh, Jose talk. I was going through this. The first level is knowledge. Cool. Accumulation of information. From knowledge, you then go to comprehension or understanding, which means you understand what you know. Because a lot of folks, you can learn something, but you have no idea how to understand what you just learned. And as a, a, a teacher of reading to five-year-olds, I've got to develop an understanding of how I can approach this five-year-old and begin to develop to connect his neurons in his brain. Neurons are nerve cells. How do I connect those neurons in that young person's brain that have never been connected before? You have 25, 30 students, and all of them have different ways of learning, so now I have to figure out that I may be getting some, but I may not be getting others. I can't afford to lose anybody, so how do I now adjust my teaching method to be able to get them all on some level to understand what it is that I'm talking The point that I'm making, I'm trying to help us understand that this system, forget it. It's a horrible system. And even if they say you're a star student, you're nowhere near the intellect of what our ancestors of the Dogon people knew who they call primitive, but they were far more intelligent than the most intelligent people in this system. And this is why I respect our people on all different levels, because I tell people, they say, they call you Dr. Cobb, but I don't have a doctor. I've got two master's degrees. I don't have a doctor. Because I was not going to invest three to four years in a system that was going to waste my time getting information that I'd rather be studying our own history and culture knowing I don't care if you call me doctor. It doesn't make a difference. I'm not interested in that. Because I've met too many ignorant doctors in my life <laughs> and too many highly intelligent people on the corner of 125th Street and Malcolm X Bullock. In fact, there was this one brother I met. I was working late, 
and I was going over to get uh, something to drink, and a brother intercepted me on 167th Street and 3rd Avenue in the Bronx. And brother, yo, man, yo, 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 man, you know, I have this book, I'd like to sell this book to you. And I, it, it, it was Paul Robeson's speech, it was a thick book. And in the middle of his conversation with me, brother started nodding out. Okay, and then when he woke back up, <laughs> you know, we started to talk. Come to find out this brother had been in the revolutionary struggle in the streets of Holland. We started talking about people that we knew. He started telling me things that he had done. Unfortunately, in his life, his life took another turn, as so many of our brothers and sisters do in this world that we call the United States. I gave the, he wanted five dollars for the book, but I had such a valuable experience with that brother, I gave him twenty dollars. So I know where intelligence is. I've met intelligence. I tell people I got my doctorate from UCLA, the university on the corner of Lenox Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not impressed with Harvard. I'm not impressed uh, with Yale. I've been there. I've done research in Egypt. I'm not impressed with them. Yet I could be impressed with a brother not now on 167th Street, 3rd Avenue. And so I just want to start on this level to help us understand the system that we have. This stuff out here is very toxic. And what we should be in learning, first and foremost, is the word education, which has a Greek Roman derivative, but it has an African origin. There is no Greek language. The alphabet is the script that Greeks could adapt when they came upon Africans. So even with A, B, C, D, E, F, and all the rest of that, you talk about Walter Williams, he has a chart in his book, the, the, the Historical Origins of Christianity, where he'll show you where Menunetta then became demonic, erratic, and shows you where in the, the, the pictograph of the vulture, the letter A was drawn out. In the letter M, which is the owl, he'll show you where in the owl drawing the letter M was drawn out. So what they did is, instead of drawing owls all the time, let's just take a visual out, and that will be the script. That's why the Greeks, fraternities and sororities, are letters. The Africans, they literally were the personification of the particular pictograph that they presented. It's an entirely different way of looking at the world around you. So that when that light turns on and you see everything in the room, you come to realize, as I did with five-year-olds, I walk into class, I walked in, well I should say I stood up, when I began to present information to you, I'm coming to you from the perspective you already know everything I'm about to tell you. And it is my job to construct a way to interact with you, to assist you in realizing you already know it. Not that I'm going to give you anything. Not that I'm going to put something in your head that wasn't here when you walked in the room. It makes you have to change the way you talk to people, the way you educate people. It's like I came to remind you of what you already know. I didn't come to give you something you didn't already have. And as students in my classroom, in understanding this, they knew. And they came in with a confidence. All I have to do is remember what Brother Cobb is telling me. This system is toxic. This is, this is what I want us to understand. And while we're going to play the game in school, Play the game, but don't invest your life in that. Everybody rushing to go to Harvard and Yale. But very few people realize that the great majority of the ancient universities that came out of Europe were introduced to this land by African people. When Oxford University Cambridge University was founded by the Moors. The libraries of Europe were created, so boom, you can go across the line, were created by the Moors, by African people going into Europe, 
at a particular time. Some of the minds of Cambridge and Oxford decided to come here to the United States and they went to New York and they created a university called King's College. They sat at the feet of Africans and then came to the United States or America, 13 colleges, and built King's College, which today we call Columbia University. Now we say, I'm the first to graduate from Columbia. No, you built Columbia. We're the first that go to Yale in my family, first to graduate from college. No, you built a collegial system. They stole your legacy, and now they're giving it back to you, contaminated. But you're so proud to say, I'm the first. You the original. When Africans went into Europe, there were no libraries, there were no universities. They didn't have soap. Africans brought in a, 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 a liquid that they called spiritual waters. That after you bathed or if you were sick, it would then disinfect that funky body. They called it alcohol, A-L-K-U-H-L. Today we call it alcohol, rubbing alcohol. We did this. I'm through arguing over the, the Africanness of Kemet. It's a done deal. We have to stop arguing over things we already know are true. But we have to set up a system for our children to understand it. The point that I'm going to focus on today is the fact. The future wealth of the planet. Wealth is its soul. Solar power. The energy from the sun. We're going to talk about this today. Because we, we, we have to redirect our thinking, play the game, take the test, I understand that. There's, look, there's two ways to pass a standardized test. I, I used to do some work with uh, uh, different types of like Kaplan's, you know, the test taking place, and, and uh, Sylvan's, you know, until they found out what I was doing. <laughs> I'm spooked and sat by the classroom. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm in the land of sand, uh, uh, you know, my brother Greek, so I got to tell you. I'm a spook who sat by the classroom door. And I've watched the system, I've watched how it operated, I've watched how they put things together. Like I say, I've developed tests before, so I know. The question and the point that they made to me when I was in the group writing these questions is, don't construct the question around what the student knows. Construct, construct the psychology of the question around what you think or perceive the student does not know. So your standardized test that you take, whether it be nursing or whether it, 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 it be radiology or whether it be a third grade test or fifth grade test, the questions are not based psychologically from the people that wrote the question. It's not based on what you know. It's based on what you don't know, so it becomes adversarial from the start. It's a fight. There's two ways you can pass a standardized test. When you know the right answer, and when you know all the wrong answers. Because by the process of elimination, if you know the wrong answers, then you already know the right answer. It don't mean you know what you're doing. It doesn't mean you can apply what you understand. Every standardized test, remember I told you about the knowledge, comprehension, app application, analysis, synthesis, and e uh, evaluation? Standardized tests only go to the second stage of that. To know and to understand. When you know and understand, you can answer the question. But it does not mean you know how to apply it, or analyze it, or synthesize it, or evaluate it. All you need to do on standardized tests is to know and to understand. It doesn't take you any place else. And that's how tests construct. And once we understand this and we develop an understanding, we know how to play the game. We've got to play the game. Play the game. Go to your schools. If you get a scholarship, go to Harvard, go to Harvard. You go to Yale, go to Yale. But don't think you're intelligent just because you went. <laughs> 
I do respect anyone that goes through the discipline of education. Please understand that. So I'm, so I'm not putting nobody down. I'm just saying, don't assume you're intelligent because you've been able to pass standardized tests like the SAT. That's my point. I'm going to judge you by your work. And if your work does not reflect the sense of intelligence, then there's a problem in our delivery and what it is that we're doing. And so it becomes important that as we start to develop this, that we have the bravery now. My brother Marcus Klein, Freedom Home Academy. Much regard, much respect to him, his staff, and all the phenomenal work that they are doing. The Marcus Garvey, Los Angeles, respect. LJ's Playpen in Wilmington, Delaware. There are wonderful oases of intel of, of, of of educational institutions that are run, directed, formulated by peoples of African descent for African people. But there's another reality out there. All of our people are not going to be able to go to those academies. So how do we get this information to the, to, to, to the majority of our people who may not have the phenomenal ability to go to a freedom home academy? An African center and one Institution costs a lot of money. It costs a lot of dedication and a lot of sacrifice. To those that can do it, it's phenomenal. For those that might not, what are our answers to them? And I am saying to you, it is our answer is in after school programs, in church programs. And what I am saying is that the way the human mind works, it doesn't take that much time. I was talking last night to the meet and greet brothers and sisters that came out. And I used the example of that commercial you see on TV where the young man uh, throws a skateboard across the kitchen floor and the mother says, I told you no skateboarding in the house. But on top of the skateboard is a report card. She picks up the report card and she says, oh my goodness, look at your passing. I knew it was a great idea to send you to Sylvan's. Now I work for Sylvan's. Sylvan's meets maybe three times a week, two hours a day. Now think of this psychology. That child's in the classroom basically seven hours a day, if not more, five days a week, 35 hours. In 35 hours, that child could not comprehend what the teacher was saying. Yet six hours of Sylvan's they were able to comprehend. So that tells me that what couldn't be done in 35 hours could be done in six. In studying the human brain and the way in which the, the human brain functions, it doesn't take a lot of time to learn something, particularly if you already know. All it takes is a, oh, we call it an aha moment, where you recognize, wow, I know it. You shouldn't be saying, I learned that. You should be saying, I remember that. And basically, the curriculum in the school is in multi-billion dollar business, benefiting <coughs> people money. I call it edge business. Simple. That is what we are experiencing right now. It's a business. Just like the penal institutions are a business, so are, because there's no place for us. So how can they make money on us? Bob Marley has a song, they build our institutions, we build their jails. Basically, we are a commodity to be used for them to be able to make money. Here's bottom line, race war. In my preparation for race war, I went into very deep research because I wanted to be able to present information in a way that our people could understand and even they could understand. Here's the bottom line. European ethnic stock. Europeans are not a race. If a person from Ireland and an African American get married, that is not an interracial marriage. That's an intercultural marriage. Because the word inter gives you the impression that it's co-equal. So interrace means that there's two races. Intra means within. 
There's no such thing as an interracial relationship. It's intraracial. Because it's within, as you were, it's within that race, intra, not inter. Being Chinese is not a race. That's an ethnic stock. There is only one race, and that is the African, <coughs> who is the human race. Like, like Dr. Richard King said, call them European Africans. <laughs> Asian Africans. Okay? There's no such thing as complexion. That's why I'm concerned about light complexion, dark complexion. There's no such thing as complexion. Because you're creating an illusion that becomes a reality. It's not complexion, it's pigmentation. You are either pigmented or less pigmented. Europeans, Africans are dark black, Europeans are light black. Am I making sense? Yes. When you were talking about words, words are very important because you create things that don't exist in words. The white race, there is no white race. There is no such thing as white. White is the absence of melanin. It, it, it is a state of pigmentation. It has nothing whatsoever to do with a reality. But someone else's illusion can become your reality if you believe it. And this is what all this is. It's a battle over the mind. And this is what we're functioning of. Illusions. My mama used to always say, look, when you're around an insane person, don't try to make them sane. Because the only thing going to happen is you going to say. Look at what's happening around us right now. The inmates have taken over the insane asylum. And the lead one is in the White House. He is a blessing from Ra. I'm so happy he's there. Because for revelation. <laughs> For everything we've ever said about him and them, he's proving. They are liars, they are cheaters, and they are thieves, and they tolerate those that do. And if, and if that can make sense to us to, to understand, the reason why you have all this going on is because the European ethnic stock, their time on this planet is high. Mm -hmm. Times of exploration. They are on the road to extinction. I've, I've got a webinar. I'm doing a webinar series. In fact, let me just say this to you. I have a website that I have a free e-course that is an outline on my next book of spirituality before religions. And also my study guide. It's about 44 pages, 45 pages, study guide. www.kabakamene.com. K-A-B-A-K-A-M-E-N-E. Kabakamene.com. You go in, you put your email in, and then it will come down to you. My six-day e-course comes down to you. Can you repeat that? K-A-B-A. K-A-M-E-N-E. -E. Website will come down. You'll get my e-course, you'll get my study guide. But when I did race war, I was so impacted by the, inf by the information that I was learning. The first thing is Charlemagne de God was on the Stephen Colbert show on June 20th, 2018 of this year. And I heard Stephen Colbert tell Charlemagne, there was an article in the New York Times today that talked about white people being on the road to extinction. You can Google it, New York Times, June 20th, 2018, by Sabrina Tavernese, T-A-V-E-R-N-I-S-E, -E, and it talks about, in 26 states, in this country, 
amongst peoples of European ethnic stock. You see, we, we have to start using that word ethnic stock to understand what an ethnic stock is. It is a mutation of the original arch. It is a mutation. The people we're dealing with right now, they're not mutations. The original arch type, A-R-C-H, some people put an E after that, but T-Y-P-E, arch type, which is the original, the arch type. Uh, the, the, the original that everything else is based on is based off of that arch type. Asians are also, and there's no such thing as Asian eyes. You know, when you say slanted eyes, there, there's no such thing as Asian eyes. As it relates to nature and science, when you are, your environment is a windy season, your eyes, in order for the winds blowing in your face, you'll squint your eyes. Future generations are born without having, nature's a beautiful thing. Nature will prepare future generations so that you don't have to exert the energy. Because energy is the cornerstone to everything we need. Energy is the cornerstone. You can judge a civilization by the source of their energy. That's how you know Africans on such a, a, a higher level of intellect because they were able to tap into energy where they didn't have to violate the earth. The pyramids are examples of that. The technos are, uh, <coughs> we'll, we'll talk about it. But the point I want to make to you is to understand why what's happening here is happening. Because it all fits in. In 26 states, in the United States of America, amongst peoples of ethnic European stock, more of them are dying than being born. There is a book, it's called The Birth Dearth, B-I-R-T-H, D-E-A-R-T-H. The, 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 the other thing, family, when I come to you and I speak, I don't want to be emotional. I, I don't want to tap into an emotion. So if I tell you that the Europeans are on the road to extinction. That sounds a little emotional because it's hope. Yeah. Good. Maybe a little wishful thinking. <laughs> but I'm not telling you this for that reason because what I'm so concerned about is if they do become extinct, are we ready to govern ourselves? Are we ready to start our own educational systems? Are our relationships between brothers and sisters in a place where we can build the empires that we need? No. So I'm telling you this out of concern for where we're headed, because if they go, what happens to us? Because at least Saddam Hussein, as crazy as he was, he kept everybody in order. As crazy as white supremacy is, it's at least a model that keeps order and arrangement. But when that white supremacy goes, which it's going, when that goes, what are we going to do? Do we have the discipline as a people to create a legal system? Looking at the nine, what I call ten, because I added health and nutrition. See, Dr. Francis Cress Wilson, being an admirer of Neely Fuller, <clears throat> took his nine areas. I call it well celebrated. Religion, economics, labor. Sex, I don't call it sex. I call it gender issues. We have some gender issues we gotta talk about. Education, which is my lane, and law. Then you have security, entertainment, and politics. Those are not. But I've added my own way to do just because I'm learning. The tenth area is health and nutrition. Because none of those nine mean nothing if we're sick. None of them nine mean nothing if we don't know Dr. Africa and Queen of Four and Dr. Sabi and Sister Ma'at. Nothing means anything if we are sick and dying from the infestation of mucus in our bodies. So health and nutrition becomes an area that we really have to look at. However, we'll return back to my One of the things that I learned is that you see all this regentrification? Moving into the black neighborhood? But please understand why that's happening. That's happening because the young people in, across the country are leaving those old people alone <coughs> to die out and they're coming back into the city. 
They're not being born. It's not that there's a whole bunch of them. Why are there so many coming into our neighborhood? It is because they're leaving Iowa. Mm -hmm. They're leaving Idaho to come to the city. And that's why there's the influx of peoples of European uh, uh, ethnic stock coming into the black neighborhood because they're moving out of their neighborhood. And their na she shows pictures of ghost towns. in the United States of America that they're dying out. You you know, when you look at our neighborhood and you see boarded up buildings and see emptiness, you should go in some of their neighborhoods. See, but they only focus on us, okay? They honor Thomas Jefferson. But Thomas Jefferson did worse than R. Kelly. Ooh. Let me tell you something. I don't excuse no one to hurt innocent people. But let's get some ma'at here. Let's get some reciprocity going on. Don't make the black man the face of pedophilia. It's not, it's not that I don't know. It's not that I'm saying innocent or guilt. I'm not saying that. The guilty must suffer. You commit the crime, you're going to do the time. I don't care who you are or what culture you are, but damn, be fair. Be fair. The reason why a lot of us look the way we look is because we are the product of European pedophilia. We excuse nobody from their crimes. And I want to be clear. See, we have to be clear in our conversations, real clear to understand how you can condemn, but at the same time understand reciprocity demands that you be fair so that everybody pays the price. Thomas Jefferson, to hide his illicit affair with a child, sent her to France. Sally Hemings was a product of his father-in-law raping a black child on the plantation. So Thomas Jefferson's wife and Sally Hemings were half-sisters. Talk about all in the family? And not just that. She was not the only illicit affair he had with children because a lot of the children on his plantation were his. He had a habit for dipping into chocolate. So it's not just Sally Hemings or George Washington. Reciprocity demands that you be fair, that you balance the crime, that everybody is judged by the same feather. That's ma'a, reciprocity. What goes around comes around. You shall reap what you sow. And so it becomes important for us to understand the dynamics of the toxicity of what we're experiencing as a people <coughs> as we go out here and try to deal with the world around us. They're coming into our neighborhoods because they are escaping their own demise. The Birth Dirt by Ben Wattenberg is a book that you might want to look at. W-A-T-T-E-N-B-E-R-G. Wrote that back in the 90s. E-N Wattenberg, B-E-R-G. Ben J. Wattenberg, Birth Dirt. You have $300? But yeah, yeah, but if you go, you'll 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 find out. Maybe ten thousand. You don't know how to find a Xerox copy that fast. Hope you don't play that. Now, the next decade, having learned what was going on in the world, another man wrote a book. He ran for president three times. His name is Pat Buchanan. He wrote a book called The Death of the West. You see this immigration thing going on? See the battle going on with Brexit and, and all of this, the, the rise of this so-called Nazi concept? There ain't no rise of Nazi concept. It, it's just always been around. It's just that it's getting more desperate. You know the immigrants <coughs> that they say are coming into Europe and they're fighting? There's a whole set of Europeans that are fighting um, the movement of immigrant people, so to speak, people of pigmentation. But it's a battle that they're going to lose. 
because the reason why they're bringing immigrants in is not because they like them. They're bringing immigrants in because Europeans are dying like record numbers. There are more black people in London and in the UK. Right? In 2009, I found that out. Italy is going to be a they said Italy is going to be an amusement park by 2075. There will be no attack. Japan is dying out. They're dying out. China is in big trouble. So, so don't let all this stuff we see about China and all the rest of that. That's why they're in Africa now, because they know. Their own, I call it the Robert De Niro effect. <laughs> the only hope that Eurasians have to exist in the future is to plant their seeds in pigmented people. And eventually, the world is going black. That's science. A little wishful thinking, but that's science. That's not personal. And so what I'm trying to present to us is the science that's going to allow us to understand what is happening. It is very real. Pat Buchanan. He ran for president three times. He's crazy. But, but he's telling the truth. And in this book he's talking about immigration. They're not bringing the immigrants into Europe, into Italy, or into Norway, or Sweden because they want them. They're bringing them in because they need a tax base, because the white generations are moving out. They're dying, and who is going to be the tax base for the country? So they're bringing immigrants in to work to collect taxes. That's why, and, and then there's a whole, like there's three quarters of Europeans saying, no, we gotta bring the immigrants in. There's one quarter that is so caught up in their craziness that they say, we don't want them brown people up in here. We don't want them black people here. But they're saying, how do you want to survive? I don't, I don't care. <laughs> you saw in Race War, uh, Jared Taylor. Uh, I don't know if this is the part that you saw, because he, cause, cause that discussion that he and I had was close to two hours. They, they only gave me seven minutes. Because, <laughs> you know, they advertise. You know, they're marketing. They, they cut it right off, so to be, oh, wow. So when it comes out that you have to post a two-hour presentation between Jared Taylor and myself going back and forth, he said, you know, I want to live, I believe, and he started talking about uh, 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 Marcus Garveyism. <laughs> I believe black people should be more like black people. I believe that I want to be with white people. And I said, I want you to be with white people too. Because the longer you are around white people, the quicker you're going to die out. <laughs> you, you're talking about you don't want black and white mixing? Neither do I. But not for the same reason. Because you, you keep, because the Europeans, Jared Taylor is not a mutation. Jared Taylor, okay. Africans moved into the northern climate, going to do this real quick just to give you a summary. Africans move into the northern climate, they're caught up in the worm ice age. They begin to depigment it. To depigment themselves, their, their morphology, their body type changes, noses change, their aquiline, because in Africa, the warmth and all those plants and chlorophyll <clears throat> sucking up all that oxygen, the nose widen to get up all that oxygen up in the nose so there's a wide nasal index. When Africans got into the cold and then that freezing air was going up, they had to become, it had to become small. Lips became small. Pigmentation. In your hair follicle, in the sebaceous gland, you have sacs of an oily, waxy substance known as sebum, S-E-B-U-M. These sacs periodically explode and send this oil up to the surface of your skin because you have basically more hair on your head, but you have it all over your body. Have you ever felt that you say, wow, it feels a little waxy? Uh, okay, well that's sebum that you're feeling. It's, it's oily, okay? And it actually comes up to protect your skin for whatever reason you may be. Science, it's not perfect. In the hair texture, when the sebum goes up to the scalp and rests on your head, it protects your scalp from the harmful rays of the sun. But sebum 
in conjunction with your hair follicles will twist the hair and kink it <clears throat> and make it curly or nappy or whatever you want to call it. But when this African got into the cold climate, the oil no longer was burnt away. It rested on the head and pulled the hair down and it became straight. To the point where your if your hair is real straight, real straight, what do you call it? Dead straight. Because your hair is down. See those elliptical kinks, those are antennas that receive energy from the sun. But in the cold where the sun isn't, the hair gonna fall. And that creates straight hair. In the cold climate, that's what made straight hair. The blackness or the brownness or the pigment in the eye went away. So the eye color changed from black to brown to light brown to green to hazel to blue. The hair color changed from black to brown to red to yellow to white. White as it relates to albinism. Albinism, not age. So this human being changed morphologically and physiologically. And then they came back to the southern lands. But nature had told them when they were still in their right mind. Look. You see them caves over there? You see them animals? Put the clothes on. Go into them caves. Hide up in there. And then when this ice age ends, I want you to return back south. When you get back south, I want you to look for the biggest and blackest person. Get back on the human chain to survive. But what nature could not account for is the fact that many of these Africans who morphed into these cro magnons because that's what my next webinar is on. The evolution, the origin and evolution of the Corsair. Right. The African, the original African that went into Europe was called the Grimaldi. Morphed into the Europe, the, the Euro-African known as Cro-Magnon. So when Cro-Magnon came back out the mountains, Cro-Magnon should have found the biggest blackest Grimaldi in order to get back on the human chain. But what Cro-Magnon did is that in the calcification of their pineal gland, they swore, I'll never go back to the origin. I'm only going to make with myself. So they inbred. And when they inbred, the mutation that made it with the mutation created a mutation of the mutation. That's what we're dealing with out here today. Not to mention, they still have part Neanderthal. That's a whole other story. But, but that's another that's a whole other thing. But the idea and the concept that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain to you is that the reason why they're dying off is because one of the first things that's making them die off, when you look at it, is that they're, they're not talking about this too much because they're too busy trying to chase us for drug addiction. That opioid got them gone. They're dying between opioid and meth is killing off them, period. Opioids are killing them in the largest of numbers. The lack of melanin in the reproductive system. Melanin in the male spermatozoa, going back to science, creates in the tail called microtubules. That's, that's the tail of the sperm divinely created to be able to swim to the egg. In that tail of the sperm, melanin creates an electricity that creates a dynamic movement of that sperm. Because remember, when a man presents his sperm within the body of a woman, once that woman gets up, that sperm is acting against the laws of gravity. Even once presented within the woman's body, still working against gravity. Because if she re remains flat, that sperm has to go against the flow. So the electricity in the tail allows 
the sperm to be able to go to the egg in a melanated reproductive male. In a, mel in a melanated woman, melanin acts as a magnet in the egg. So now we have electromagnetism. That's the dynamics of trial. This is science. This is not personal. I, that's why they're impotent and sterile. Because in a lack of melanin in the European ethnic stock, there's no electricity in the tail. And in European women, there's no magnetism in the egg. So the sperm never gets to the egg. That's why Robert De Niro has to plant his seed in black women. Because her magnetism makes up for the lack of his electricity. Am I making sense? Because I want to make sense here. I, I want to talk scientifically, walking us through so our neurons are connected in a way that it sort of kind of makes sense. And I'm not just saying this because I just wish they would vanish. They're vanishing. But not because I want them to, but because nature demands it. As I said in race, race war, Europeans came into existence by mistake. But they're going out on purpose. Fine tooth comb goes over their body from their head top to where their shoes stop, looking for melanomas. There is a book. It's titled Saving Your Skin. Skin. This is the note. taking notes last night. By by Barney Kennett. Barney K E N E T. E.T. and Patricia Law, L-A-W-L-O-R, called Saving Your Skin, L-O-R, Law. In this book, it wasn't written for us. We've studied books on melanin. Richard King, Francis Dress Wilson, uh, uh, Patricia Newton, uh, our, 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 our brother, um, Numbers of people. Those books tell you what happens when you have melanin. This book was written for Europeans to tell them what happens when you don't have melanin. Australia. More people die from melanoma than any other disease. Australia. They, they have a national slogan, slip, slap, slap. When you're riding in the streets, all sorts of advertising. Slip, slap, slap. Slip on a <coughs> slip, uh, uh, slip on a t-shirt, slap on a hat, mm -hmm. and slap the suntan. <laughs> slip, slap, slap is a national low, uh, uh, slogan mm -hmm. in Australia. When they started to first diagnose melanomas, because remember, Europeans have a penchant for taking off their clothes. And it's been getting progressively more as time has gone on. When they first started doing these, there's a chart in this book. In 1935, they came to realize that one out of every 3,500 Europeans had melanoma. Make a long story short, they did this study over a period of every maybe 50 years or so, 20 years. By 19, this book was written in 1994, summer of 94. By the time they did another study in 1990, what they found was that through the years that they did the study, by the time it got to 1990, the study said that one out of every 75 European people would have a melanoma or melanomas in their lifetime. They projected that by the year 2010, almost every European would have a melanoma. And they predicted that by the turn of this next century, which, which would be, well, let, let, let's, let, let's not say that, let's just put it at 2030. They're actually finding that babies can be born with melanomas within the womb of the mother. So you don't even have to be exposed to the sun anymore. If the mother has been exposed, and if the, and, and if the generations have been exposed, they literally can be born with melanomas. They're dying out. But family, my question is, what are we going to do? 
I'm not telling you this for us to be happy that they're the hanging out. I'm saying a mother and father who ran things in the house, who knew where everything was, who understood how to make things function in the house, if mother and father die, what the children are? What are we going to do? So I have an emergency. And my contribution, because I don't, I, don't, I don't cross lanes. I, I believe my strength and my contribution to our community is in education. Those other nine, ten areas that I told you about, we have our politicians, and we have our lawyers, and we have our health and nutritionists. Okay? I may have a knowledge of those areas, but I don't claim that's my lane. I stay in my lane. And I have to thank my brother, Dr. Ben. Not Dr. Ben Yakin, Dr. Ben Carson. <laughs> you know, you gotta take the best and leave the rest. You gotta get the sense out the nonsense. The one thing that Dr. Ben Carson taught me, listen, when I was in when I when I, when I taught eighth grade language arts, reading to children, I used his book Gifted Hands as a book to be read by our children. I was so proud of Ben Carson. Brain surgeon, neurosurgeon. It's his brother. I said, wow. I just had an awestruck respect for him. Yeah. Yeah. And then. <laughs> <laughs> valuable lessons I ever learned in my life. An absolute genius can become an absolute fool when they get out of their way. See, sometimes when you're a genius in an area, if your ego is strong, ego means edging God out, edging that spirit or energy out of yourself. Your ego can make you think that if I'm good in this, I can be good in that. But after a while, your failure should show you, you know, I don't think you're too good at it. You should have an early warning system that tells you, I better get back in my life. This man and those around him are so ignorant that they put him in housing and urban development as opposed to being the Surgeon General. Right, sir. Right, right, sir. That right there told me they had problems. Right. Not to mention, psychologically, he's, he's not equipped anyway. Stay in the operating room. Stay in your lane. Because that's where you will be known. Isn't it a shame that despite the fact that he is recognized in the African American Museum in D.C., he will always be remembered as a fool. <laughs> That's sad, you know. That's very sad. Because he could have gone down in history. So that every time you go to the African American Museum and you see him as one of the heroes in African American history as a brain surgeon, what's most people going to say? Oh, is that that fool? <laughs> Uh, um, Dr. Uh, Barney Kenneth, K E N E T, and they had a child. Mother died. Father returned to France with his son. Mother's name was Marie Dumas. The son's name was Thomas Alexander Dumas. His father got married. Alexander got very upset with his father and repudiated the fam uh, his father's name and embraced his mother's name, Marie Dumont. So he's known as Thomas Alexander Dumont. Thomas Alexander Dumont was one of the finest military men in Europe. He was sent by France to go into Egypt to open it up. Thomas Dumont opened up Egypt for France followed by Napoleon. Now, Napoleon, when he gets there, 
Thomas Dumas is, is loved by the people of France. And pretty soon the job was done. And so, word got to Napoleon, who was over Thomas Dumas, that the first person that returned to France probably would become emperor. Napoleon, figuring this out, decided that he was going to let the enemy know where Thomas Dumas, he sent Dumas into the enemy territory to be captured and held in prison for four years. He then was released, returned back to France, but by then Napoleon had already been in France and he became the emperor of France. If Thomas Alexander Dumas, a brother from Haiti, had gotten back to France, the that emperor, his name would have been Thomas Dumas. This is the entry that's going on. However, Thomas Dumas has a child. He names him Alexander Dumas, who is the one that's written all these great books, The Three Musketeers, The Man in the Iron Mask. The Three Musketeers opens up a scene. For those that have read the book or seen the movie, you know it opens up with D'Artagnan, who fights the Three Musketeers. There was a story of his father, Thomas Dumas, who was such a prolific fighter that he could fight a series of men at one time. D'Artagnan really is a mass honoring that Alexander Dumas gave to his African father, Thomas Dumas. D'Artagnan really is the story of that concept of Alexander Dumas Thomas, the father. But not just that. There, is, there was another brother, Chevalier Saint Georges. Chevalier was the greatest fencer in Europe. And Chevalier St. George, he was also the greatest violinist. If you Google Chevalier, because I, I have this music on my iPod. Chevalier St. George and, and Thomas Alexander Dumas fighting within the French Revolution, these, they used to go throughout African Caribbean recruiting Africans to come fight in the French Revolution. These brothers were so dynamic that when they weren't fighting, they were a musical band. <laughs> Google Chevalier St. George. Un understand who our history is. Understand who we are as people. And where we are and the illusion that they are trying to get us to embrace as to who they want us not to think of. Constantine Duvalny was one of the scholars that went. He wrote a book called Ruins of Empire, where he's telling people the very people we are enslaving are the very builders of these pyramids and, and the great civilizations of Egypt. Napoleon knew that. Napoleon was aware of the greatness of African people in Egypt. <clears throat> My decision to destroy the authority of the blacks in San Domingue IED, is not so much based on considerations of commerce and money as on the need to block forever the march of the blacks in the world. He already knew the Moors. He already knew what Africans had done in Europe. So the enslavement of African people is not just as it relates to the economics of the enslavement process, it was to make sure that Africans would never rise again. IED is still paying the price for that. African people are still paying the price for that. Detroit is still paying the price for that. Englewood is still paying the price for that. So when they're shoving those guns into the community, they know if those brothers and sisters who those guns are shoved against learn once and for all who to aim at, But the question becomes, as, as we leave here today, my question to you is what you want to do. 
Is this just another presentation waiting to come back next Saturday to celebrate the Earth Day of our brother Jose? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> is, 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 is that what this is? Is this just another way? Because I tell you, I, I don't do concerts. Yeah. I come in to roll back my sleeves to work. Ain't no time for no concerts. I don't come in to sing and then leave. And the reason why the introduction by Brother Nate and Brother Jose was so important is that my focus is on the community here in Chicago. You, you have greatness right here in Chicago. Sometimes you bring people in from outside of Chicago, but you got people in Chicago that's been telling you this long before I ever came. You have the Dr. Jake Carruthers Institute. Come on. Dr. Jake Carruthers. I sat at that brother's feet. Riketty Wimby, who literally imploded and exploded the concept of men who met for our community. Dr. Joseph Ben Levy. You've got scholars right here in Chicago doing this. You have the ability to build. The question is, do we have the heart and the courage to do it? Where, where are we spending our money? Crackdown? Murder King? Haunted Castle? <laughs> what are we telling our children? What, what, what are we doing? What are we... What do we hope to do after today? What are we going to do? Does this just become another presentation that we attended, got some information, or are we going to do something? Because if we're not going to do it, then this means nothing. If, 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 come, if, if after I leave, nothing, so to speak, is done, and it's just another, I fail. I failed in my mission, because my mission is to motivate and inspire us to do something for our future, because there's going to come a time when the people that you depend on ain't no more EBT, no more public assistance. It's not going to be here. What are we going to do to, to sustain ourselves? That's, that's my question. To us as people, we have to do something. We have to promise ourselves from this day on, and many of you are already doing great things. So I'm, speaking, I'm speaking about that the habit of coming to presentations and then just leaving and nothing else happening after that. This curriculum that I developed, I didn't ask anybody outside of my culture permission to do this. I, I, I don't even offer it to people outside of my culture. Because I've learned over time that even if I should do that, the first thing they would do is try to destroy it. They would table it. They don't want this. And I don't blame them. Dr. Clark used to always tell us, if your education isn't based in empowering you, it ain't education. Everything that is done is to empower. Empower, not just I am power. I am power. In power. Peter's projection map is something we all should be exposed to. Peter's projection map are the most current projections of what the continents actually look like from outer space. These are pictures taken of the continents. The Mercator map was done through mathematical and scientific calculations. It was made from merchants. Mer that's why it's called Mercator, from Mercantile. Africa is much larger, South America is much larger, Australia is much larger, and Europe is much smaller. Not to mention Europe is in the continent. Because in, in geography class we teach, what's a continent? Yes, but, but there's another word inside of that. Large land mass surrounded by water. What is Europe? It's a peninsula. A peninsula is a large land mass surrounded on three sides by water. So why is Europe a continent? Because they wrote the book. Because, you know, the horse you know, told Paul Revere, hey, if I was writing this book, I'd be the hero because I'm the one that carried you through the town. <laughs> this is a map that we should all have. You can go to Friendship Press. Friendshippress.com, you can get that. I also have this map in just the continent of Africa. They, they break it up according to continents. Educationally, this should be in all of our homes. Because the image of Africa being big, negates the image, like my brother Jose talked about his piece of images, 
Images are everything. When you see Africa for what it really is, and you see Asia for what it really is, come on, you telling me you count every Chinese people? You count every African? You telling me that China is the most populous continent? How do you know that? You must be out of your mind if you think I'm going to believe that. It's not true. The scientific method. Now, here's where we get down to science. Scientific method is very important. There's six, six parts to the scientific method. This was done by Dr. Theofalio Benga in showing how the scientific method that we use in science class today was based and learned from the Akmes Moscow Papyri. Our ancestors practiced the scientific method. Basically, six steps. This, this is just science. Because what I want to tell you is based on the scientific method. So that, see, when I present it this way, people who would wish to challenge me, they, they hesitate. Because they understand what I'm about to drop on you is science, wisdom, and knowledge. And unless you can bring me primary sources that can negate what I'm saying, then you must forfeit the conversation. The scientific method demonstrates how the scientific method was grounded in comedic soul science. The glossary, words that you should uh, look at is data, which is information, hypothesis, suggested answer to a problem, and the scientific method is a model or guide used to solve problems and to get information. The scientific method, background information, time doesn't allow me to read all of this, so that's not important. This is just a presentation. This is just the background information as to why you use a scientific method to come up with the conclusions that you come up with. The source of what I'm about to tell you comes from the Akmose, or the Rhine and Moscow Papyri. Nowadays, the scientific mind deals with analysis and synthesis. The Greek logos word is, in fact, the power with which every question is handled. This is said by Dr. Theofalio Benga at a Morehouse College lecture in 1993. Step number one in the scientific method, you identify and state the problem. The Kemites called it the question, the enunciation, to, an, to announce the question, the question of the problem, step number one. Step number two, gather information, finding the facts, and positioning the problem that you, that you have created a question on. Step three, you state your hypothesis which is the concept or the framework upon which your question was based. And you define the different areas of your question and how you're going to approach by, by uh, the gathering of the information. Now, with the gathering of the information, you design an experiment and you define the exact procedure with your ex expected result. Step number five is from your experiment, you make observations, you record, organize, and analyze your data, which becomes your proof. Sixth step is you draw or state your conclusion. Okay, now, let me show you something. They tell us about our history. I'm, I'm going to read this to you because I think this is important. Dr. Robin Walker, brilliant scholar out of uh, UK, London, wrote a book titled When We Rule. And in the beginning of his book, in, in, in his introduction, he talks about a nation that was found in southwest Nigeria, which today would be the Igbo. Yoruba, um, the, uh, the, uh, Yor the, the Yoruba, the Igbo, and the House of Fulani in the north. Okay? Basically, when we look at the great nations of Nigeria, we look at four major nations. Scholars divide the over 3,000 year history of southern Nigeria into four great cultural periods the Nak culture, Igbo Ukwu culture, Yoruba kingdoms, and the Benin Empire. It's taken from his book, page 5. 
Now, they found in Eredo, E-R-E-D-O, southwest <coughs> Nigeria, since 1994, there has yet been another Nigerian kingdom previously covered by centuries of forest growth. It has been described as Africa's largest single monument. At Eredu, in southwest Nigeria, there was a huge earthen wall with moated sections. This encircled an ancient kingdom or city. From the base of the ditch to the summit of the rampart, rampart is the wall, measured a towering 70 feet. Well, 70 feet would basically be a seven-story building. Okay? The pyramids are, are, are 400, over 400 feet, like, like, like 41 stories high. In the Sunday Times, Mark McCaskill wrote this. The rampart was 100 miles long and formed a rough circle enclosing more than 400 square miles. How big is Chicago? It ain't nowhere near that size. From New York to Philadelphia is 80 miles. Imagine a city that's as large as going from New York to Delaware. And it's a circle and there's a wall that is all the way around it. The builders shifted 3.5 million cubic meters of earth to build just the rampart alone. One million cubic meters more than the amount of rock and earth used in the Great Pyramid of Giza. Dr. Clark used to always say, you know, you don't get all romantic and exotic about Egypt, but all of Africa. This Nigeria is the same place where they're stealing Africans from, telling us how primitive we are. Yet there is no city in Europe that's anywhere near comparable to this city. Therefore, Eredo's construction is estimated to have involved about one million more man hours than were necessary to build the Great Pyramid. Come on, family, do you know who we are? But check this out. The ramparts may indicate the boundary of the original Ijebu kingdom that was ruled by a spiritual leader called the Awuja. McCaskill describes Eredo as a city. This would make Eredo one of the very largest cities in all of human history. We're talking about southwest Nigeria now. Among the discoveries in this city, a three-story ruin has been identified tentatively as a royal palace. It had living quarters, shrines, and courtyards. It is possible that thousands of smaller buildings are still concealed by the forest and will be mapped in time. Radiocarbon dating has so far established that the buildings and walls were more than 1,000 years old. Dates such as 800 AD have been suggested. But if that 400 square mile city was up and running 800 AD, who was the mind that thought to build it in the first place? And when did they start? So this city was probably up and running when the pyramids were being built in Kemet. So when you want to push our history somewhere, we better do this on our own. Because the people that are writing these books are not going to tell you this. They're not going to tell you that Africans are primitive and we took them from the place that there's a 400 mile city in existence when Europeans were still in caves. People who live near the ruined kingdom or city today have traditions that a wealthy and childless queen, Bilikisu Songo, built the city. Some say that she built the city as a religious offering. It is also claimed that Sukbo's territory had a gold and ivory trade, which tells you something else about the economic development of this kingdom during the time of the pyramids. We're talking about Southwest Nigeria, not Egypt. Before the 12th Dynasty period, historians know of only two organized states on the planet Earth, Nubia and Egypt. During the 12th Dynasty, states would appear for the first time in Asia. Of these, Sumer, which is Iraq, emerged first around 3300 BC by Africa. 
period. I don't want to hear no more of that. It's in there. It was quickly followed by Elam, which is in Iran, because what you have happening is a movement of Africans from west to east. So that's why you have the formations of Asia traveling and developing themselves from west to east. And then the Indus Valley civilization, which is today Western India and Pakistan. Now, Dr. Clark used to always say, spend 45 minutes with your introduction and then get into your conversation. I'm just ready to start class. I got all the other stuff. Just hold on. Yeah, okay. Okay, we'll take about but, but hold on, if I could just finish this, then we can go back to something. Yeah, we're, oh, we're going to take a break. And and by the way, from all, I have my DVDs. I, I, I've, I've got two of my caps here, only oh, got two. I got some bow ties for the Nation of Islam. Oh, anybody could have bow ties. <laughs> but I figured, you know, I, I sold out in 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 in, in, in Sold out. Four types of uh, cultures. Like I told you, you judge your civilization by the source of your energy. Michu Kaku wrote a book. It's titled, The Physics of the Future. He defined the first level of energy as Earth energy, where the civilization depends on water, oil, wind. After you have used up all of your resources, or you've gotten to a point where you can then move to the next level of energy absorption, you have the second level, which is your sun energy, where you depend on your light, heat, and sound energy. Your third is your galactic energy, which uh, deals with the millions of stars of the Milky Way. Now, family, imagine with us developing ourselves around solar power. Imagine if we can get everything energized using the sun. What happens when that civilization rises to a certain level that you use the sun as your satellite so that each and every one of us has our own star that we draw our energy? Think of that type of energy. If we, in the, as a collective human family, can absorb the sun's light and do all these things that we're doing, eat our homes, run our cars, imagine what we could do if each and every one of us had our own star using the sun as our satellite. The fourth one. The fourth level is cosmic energy. That's where each of us has our own galaxy of stars. Drawing the energy, imagine what we could do. This is where we have to go as we begin to develop understanding this world. This is where I can go into my culture and I can teach you the 18th dynasty to show you that this African, Akhenaten, continued a tradition of all of his family. They, they say he changed, but he didn't do that. What he did was political in nature, but he used the Aten as a way to get the people's minds. Pretty much like what the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did, or the Honorable Noble Drew Ali. Because the Honorable Noble Drew Ali gave birth to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a student of the Honorable Noble Drew Ali. And so what Noble Drew Ali, for the first time in African current history, in the turn of the 19th century, uh, 20th century, he was able to get people's, uh, he broke the hold of Christianity on the minds of African people, and he was able to move the thought process of African people into another spiritual system. I'm not judging the system, right or wrong, good or bad. What I'm saying is he shifted the thought process. Akhenaten did the same thing. He moved the people from the Amen priesthood to the Aten priesthood. But it was a political move. It was political, it was not personal. And he devised what is called the Great Hymn to the Aten, which is a scientific encyclopedia dedicated to the sun. With that, I will let you all marinate on that for a little while, because when we come back, I'm going to show you how we can bring solar power into our class. I am going to uh, Here is the book. And these are my notes. What I do is when, and you know, in the form of study, I also want to introduce this to you as, uh, as it relates to study. You know, even with my children, 
there, there is a book that I've got. I, I was advised, David and Hotep, who wrote the first Americans for Africans, he, he, he and I were talking, and he told me about a book that he studied in college. And it's called The Art of Study. In fact, my notes on the art of study. This is um, the Sorbonne method, Edmund Bordeaux Skelly. This is what all, you did. we should have a class with our children on this level. We keep telling our children to study, but we never taught them how to study. Peoples of African descent in the ancient world had a formalized approach to study. They did not play when it came to study. There's a method in the brain to connect neurons. What our ancestors did in the transmission of information in their schools, this is universal. I might be talking about what they did thousands of years ago, but it is applicable and will be applicable thousands of years from now. It's a universal method of study. And what I always do when I'm, I'm, I'm doing this type of work is I take my notes, I'll put the name of the book on top, all of the other pertinent information about the publisher, uh, the writer, and the date. And then what I'll do is I will make sure that I will tell you where... Now, this is a pamphlet, by the way, and there's no page numbers on it. So this is a book that I didn't put page numbers on. But normally I put page numbers. You'll see what I'm going to do with the other book with physics. But there is a method of the Sorbonne. Sorbonne, out of France, is directly related to what Africans brought into Europe. The Sorbonne method is an African method of study that education, educare, to educe means to draw out. It doesn't mean to put in. So an educator is attempting to always draw out. Remember I told you you were born with all the information you need? That's my point. My job is to draw out of you your recognition that you already know. Not that I'm feeding you something it's that I'm bringing out what you already know, hoping that in a discussion, which is called the Socratic method, which is a questioning technique, that and is, it's called food, F-O-O-D, the questioning method. What I, what I used to do with my children is that I would teach through questions. It's called the Socratic method, which you got from Africa, but we, 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 we already know that. Food, there are four types of questions. Factual, opinion, open-ended, descriptive. Factual, yes or no answer. If I ask you a question, is it snowing outside? Is it yes or no answer? If I said to you, how do you like the snow? That's opinion. Factual is either right or wrong. Opinion, nobody's wrong. Open-ended is when I ask you a question that's open-ended, and normally the three words that's used in an open-ended question is C, S-E-A, the word some, ever, any. Have you ever been to the Caribbean? That's an open-ended question because I'm depending on you. Now, descriptive is the follow-up to the open-ended, which if, you, if I said, have you ever been to the Caribbean, you say yes. Where did you go? And then you describe where you've been. So the Socratic method of teaching in relationship to the art of study. How do you study? Brother California was getting a doctor. And in his search for how he wanted, uh, uh, what he wanted to study in terms of his paper, he came to realize that African and Hispanic students in California did not do as well as the Asian and European students. In his research, remember the scientific method? Okay, he posed a question. Okay? And then, after he posed the question, why do certain students do better than others? Okay? Then he began to gather information. In the gathering of his information, he came to realize that on campus, European and Asian students studied in groups. 
and African and Hispanic students study alone. He then created a hypothesis and said, what would happen if I form groups? So then he did his, his experiment, where he formed groups with African and Hispanic students. And what he found is that every five, no larger than five in a group, what he found was that every, within a group of five people, somebody got the answer. When you bring five together, now there are, I don't speak in absolute, so part of it is right, part of it may not be as accurate. But he found that if you bring five students together, somebody has the answer to everything, whether you're studying math or science or language arts or whatever, social studies. In his experiment, he came to realize that in his other group, African and Hispanic students studied longer and harder, but they didn't study in groups. He found that African and Hispanic students that studied in this group studied less time, but did better. So one of the things we have to do is start to form groups of students in our after-school programs. Groups of students, no larger than five, maybe four or five students, studying groups, as opposed to having them in, in rows and columns doing their own work individually because you're trying to control and contain them, have them study group and be excited by noise. See, my classrooms were noisy. <laughs> when I taught kindergarten, I used to always tell the principal when she would come in to observe me, I'd say, look, doctor, don't judge my class by the noise. Judge my class if the students are on task. And I was always very, I appreciated noisy classrooms because that meant, and as long as you're on task, I'm not talking about playing around. What I noticed was that students that were engaged and enjoying were able to assimilate information as long as you're on task. And being on task and studying created an excitement to want to learn. So that between the art of study and, um, and the Socratic method in the dynamics of the classroom, Always asking questions. Okay, meet you, Cop. Am, am I doing something that's making this so big? Uh, can, oh, wait, maybe I should reduce the size. Okay, there we go. There we go. Okay. What I normally do again, you see the title of the book? Okay. But what I do is that I'll give the page number here. Because let's say I say so, I say it is important to understand two things, the physical laws of the universe and a single coherent theory, and to see the future. That's the purpose of the book. Let's say you were invigorated by that. You say, well, I want to study that. Suppose the page number wasn't there. You might not know where to find that in the book. But by giving you the page number, you know to go to page three. So when we take notes out of books, we should always put the page number. It might take a little bit more time, but in the long run, it saves you a lot of time because then you don't have to look through the whole book to find out where that was set. So, so I find that it's very important. And again, going down, you see page four, page six, seven. The future is already here. Now, just that I, that I want to say on this particular piece right here. In the introduction, Michu Kaku is talking about the fact that... Um, in the turn of the 20th century, the 1900s, they did a research project. All the scientists came together. They, they did it every 100 years. And the scientists projected where science would be in 100 years. Michu Kaku is writing this book in like 2014, 2015. So he's projecting where science will be in 2016. They were projecting where would science be in 2016. Remember, this is really in the beginning of the car. This is the beginning of a time when you're going to the, the early 1900s, the cars ain't on the roads like it is today. We're not using oil in our cars like we do it. So there's a lot that's not in that society back 43 to 295, the future of energy. Where is energy going into the future? End of oil. The, and then he breaks it down into different levels, different year. Near future, present to uh, 2030, We'll still be using wind power, we'll still be using water power, but we are going to be segueing into solar power. 
The pyramids are evidence of soul power. Excuse me for a minute, everybody. about Kemet when I first came back from Kemet. I was so excited. And I was teaching them about Kemet. And at the end of my, I was showing them slides and everything. And at the end of my presentation, I said to them, well, they said to me, Brother Calvin, next time we go on a class trip, can we go to ancient Egypt? And what I realized was that it's called spatiality. If you give a child five small balls and one big ball, and you say to them, which is more, many times children will pick the big ball instead of the five small ones. Their perception of space and time, of, in terms of what's more, they see something big to them that's more. So I came to realize that had I explained to the children that ancient Egypt was long ago, and Egypt is far away, space and time, they would have then understood that it's not about going there on the next class trip. But because I didn't introduce those two concepts to them, it was so close to them in terms of my slides, in terms of my conversation, it seemed like it was some place that we could go. Ancient Egypt was a place, hey, we could go to ancient Egypt. <laughs> so I've always introduced everything I do as it relates to geography and time, and, and time because if you can locate where you're going and the time you're going, you can take somewhere anywhere you want to on the planet. Here's another example. There's a movie, it's called Stargate. And in Stargate, it opens up with 10,000 BC. It stays on that subject for about, give or take a minute, 15 seconds, let's say. Then, it takes you to Egypt, 1932. You stay there for about three months in that scene. The third scene, after that, which is about maybe three or four minutes into the film, they then take you to present day New York, into a museum. If you walked in nine minutes late, you wouldn't be able to follow the movie. Because everything that that movie is based on for the next hour and a half is based on what you experienced in those first two scenes that were in the, in, in, in the past. So your framework of understanding something comes from your, your being uh, um, in the proper geographical space and the historical time. So in introducing this concept, I start with geography. Where are we talking about? And so I give you a series of maps. Then I give you your, your, your definition, or what we call a glossary. What are we talking about? Cosmic ray, uh, uh, cosmologist, uh, um, cosmology. And then we do a little science in photovoltaics and the Aten text. 
where I'm showing you a comparison of what is photovoltaics. Photo is light, voltaics is electricity. Photovoltaics is electricity created by light. We then go deeper into photovoltaics. I tell you more about photovoltaics. And then I talk about electricity, sunlight, electricity from sunlight, and I talk about basic building blocks. What I'm doing is I'm building your neurons. I'm connecting your neurons. What I found in education is that when we talk to people, we come in with a wide amount of information. But we talk to our, our people, our, our, those that are in attendance, as if they know what's in my mind. I can't assume you know what I'm talking about. So I break it down so that we can walk through this process and understand from a deeper perspective. So I'm building your neurons as I would do with a child. I'm building your neurons. You'll understand it, but I also understand there's building blocks that take you through the process of learning. <clears throat> then I talk to you about what the sun does. What is the sun doing? The job of the sun in its entire existence is to fuse hydrogen atoms. That's the job of sun, to fuse hydrogen atoms. As the sun fuses hydrogen atoms, and here's the mathematical calculations, because atoms have what's called an atomic mass weight. When that fusion takes place with the helium, it cre uh, uh, with the hydrogen, it creates a helium atom. But in that fusion, some energy escapes from creating helium, and that energy that escapes is what comes down as light, heat, and sound energy on Earth. Part of that that escapes, 0 0.0285 light, heat, energy, part of a micro piece of that is what's called a free radical, and that free radical is what causes cancer. For everything that exists in nature, there's a free radical. White folk are free radicals of humanity. <laughs> There's something wrong. For everything that is natural, there is a fraction that's unnatural. What's natural is the human family. What's unnatural is the European. And so we go through this process. And I use children. I use children as the adults. Particularly the ones that are very, let's call it kinesthetic in nature. The ones that are moving around the classroom, we want to move around, I'll make you an atom. There. How about that? Sometimes there too. I'll make the free rider move back into nature. I'll make you do the right thing. And so here we talk about colored stuff. You know, you know, they have this thing today. You know, we think about red hot and cool blue. But in space, the hottest stars are blue and the coolest ones are red. It's not red hot, it's red cool and blue hot. And then we go through the life of a star, the life of a human. I, I can show you what the birth of a star is identical to the birth of a human. It, it's, it's exactly like. There's a pattern in the tapping. Then I talk about waves. The waves that come, the, the raw, the waves that do come down to Earth. Light waves, color waves. Okay. This is what we teach children, high school, college. Here's part two of the Aten text. Now we're going to get into ultraviolet rays. Remember, we're talking about solar power now. We're talking about it in the past, but we're talking about it in the present in order to how do we teach this to our children to have them master the sun so they can become solar scientists, soul scientists. Three types of ultraviolet. UVA, UVB, and UVC. The frequencies. We talk about frequency from a metaphysical or spiritual perspective, but there, there is a science that is related right back to that concept. The, the electromagnetic spectrum. We talked about the, the electromagnetism in the reproductive system of the human. Here it is again in science. The electromagnetic spectrum. 
Then we get into what electrical currents and magnetic fields are. They were born to live together. Electrical currents create magnetic fields. Magnetic fields then return back to empower the, the electrical currents. In humanity, the, the end result is a child. Science. Oh. Today's wave symbol, and then I show you where in Kemet they had the same symbol, which was the Uranus. They knew of the electro, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the electromagnetic wave. Here it is depicted wave equals from Ra, from the cosmic ray to the radio waves. See, we only see uh, through this particular from infrared to ultraviolet. That's all we can see. Our, our eyes perceive infrared, ultraviolet, which is the, um, the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, indigo, and violet. And then violet will return back to the cosmos as the perfect black. As human beings, this comes from Jewel Bukram's work, Vitamin to Mineral from A to Z. She shows the perception that people have according to their melanation. From the highest to the lowest frequency, African people see everything. That's why when you're in a mixed group, don't ever ask them, did you see that? Or did you hear that? Did you feel that? Because your melanation within your systems relate back to that. They don't hear things. You pick it up, you hear them. You see things. Can we also take in every color radiation within that wave spectrum as well? We take, we, all of this we absorb. We are that. Do you know that you gotta be careful how many melanated people you have in a room because melanated people absorb light. That's why everybody stopped talking when you walk in the room. Because you done took up all the life. <laughs> but let, 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 let me prove that. For those of you who are in TV or in front of cameras, what do they tell you? Don't wear white. Because the light, the light will reflect off your white suit. That's why they say wear black. Because black as a suit or a dress, red, dark, deep colors, absorb the light as opposed to deflect the science. Your, your melanation creates a very serious problem when you walk into a room. That's why everybody shut down when you walk in. Because they're scared. They say, who are you? <laughs> because, you because you're taking all the heat. Please, brother. Polar bears aren't white. Say again? Polar bears aren't white. Okay. They need white on them. Okay. The fur is transparent. Okay. Cracks light. Okay. And the skin is black. Interesting. Okay. And the gorilla is all of that in, uh, uh, combined. Same thing with white rabbits and brown rabbits. White rabbits are in the winter, turn brown in the summer. Please, my brother. Did, did yeah, you? I was just going to say, I thought it was kind of coincidental that um, that color spectrum from red to, red to violet is also the colors of the chakras in order for mm. to, to, mm. to the chakra. Same exact thing. Because once you hit a certain point, you're out. You're, 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 you're not even on this earth. But you know, you're, you know, you're not earthlings. You know, you're really not even starlings. You're godlings. Godlings is a combination of stars on Earth. Each and every one of them. And so then we start to define the different types of light. So that you can under, um, you know, so that you can get a sense of, and again, I'm Africanizing this. Because these science books ain't going to tell you what I'm going to tell you. So this is a combination of Delbert Blair, Bobby Emmett, Bill Valentine, and uh, the Britannica Science Dictionary. Sure enough. Because I, 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 I can't handle what they say. Them people are something else. <laughs> Please, brother. I don't really get off the subject, but what do you say to those who contain that it's impossible that the pyramids were built by, by man, that they were visited? By some other. Yeah. Um, aliens too. Yeah, well, you know, well, to, 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 to answer your uh, question straightforward, I, I understand what they're trying to do. But 
the fact of the matter is, is that trial and error shows you how our ancestors in Africa, going into inner Africa Kush, developed and perfected the concept of the pyramid, starting with the uh, tumuli, which are like ways in which they contract the sun. Like they, 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 they raised them up out the ground and they dealt with shadows. So according to where the shadow was on the earth, it was like a clock on the earth. Sundial is another way to say it. And as they moved through Kush, moving up through Africa, you can see them perfecting it. You can see Imhotep's Sakura Pyramid, which is the step pyramid, then be perfected into the pyramid and Medum, and then Medum becomes Giza. So you can see the trial and error of human beings perfecting the mathematics and science that would build the pyramids. In fact, Imhotep not only built the step pyramid, he also put in place the math for the perfect pyramid, but he knew he wouldn't live long enough to be able to exercise that. So what he did is he left the blueprint. So that within 100 years, that pyramid was perfected into the Khufu pyramid, named after Khufu, but it really wasn't that, because all those pyramids really were aligned with the stars in Orion's constellation. And there were over 80 pyramids in Giza, and it was in a walled city. So I can see trial and error of human beings perfecting their, their science. So I want no aid. Because I can see the, the, the trial and error of, of our ancestors. But again, it goes back to, if I were them, I would too. I, you know, I would try to give you a great <laughs> I mean, why, you know, why am I going to give you the power? I would have to be out of my mind. As a people on the road to extinction, to give you your immortality. There's a video on YouTube where they, um, the, the, the viewer refers to the, the Anunnaki as the Hyperborean race, which is the dominant melanin. Yeah. So even the, even when they reference the Anunnaki on YouTube, they refer to the pyramids that they refer to us. Yeah. And, and see, we can have many names. But I, but I always tell people, don't get caught up in names. Get caught up in the fact, whoever they were, they were African. Hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know, it's the same thing I say to my brothers who are Moors or Hebrew Israelites, right. or Negroes or African American colors, right. <laughs> Nagas. <laughs> Whatever you want to call yourself, you call yourself, and I'll call you that too. Right. But in the back of my mind, I say, yo, that's African. Yep. You call yourself African. But you're the original human being, so let's... Uh, I don't get caught up in, in all these little compartments. Right. It's funny, you know, these, these so-called illegal aliens. I can't get over these illegal aliens. <laughs> the very people they're calling illegal aliens were the original people pushed south by the original illegal aliens. It's like they come into your house and steal your house, push you in your bedroom, yes, and all of a sudden you come out and they say, you can't come out here, you're illegal. <laughs> but I owned the house before you stole it. Yeah. It's all according to who write the book, who illegal. Those Central and South Americans were already on the American hemisphere. And before them, they were Africans. These people we call Native Americans, they're the fifth migration of humans to this part of the world. They're, they're the Asian invasion. During, during the Mongol invasions. And then before them, you, you had the Inuit or the Eskimo. Eskimos derogatory. And then before the Inuit, you had the Algonquin, who were African. Before Algonquin, you had Clovis Folsom, African. Before that, you had the Paleo Americans, they were African. See, I'm tired of talking to them, to tell you the truth. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather talk to you because mm. they're going off the planet. Yeah. I don't care about them. <laughs> you all still be here. That's why I'm going to talk to you. Yeah. <clears throat> that, 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 that goes to tomorrow, too. Check it out. So, here are certain excerpts. Here are certain excerpts from the pyramid text and the coffin text that identify the sun and will talk to you about the fact they were aware of the light and heat energy that came from the sun that created life on earth. And here is a, a, 
an essay I, I read or I researched through William Leo Hansberry, who spoke about Africa's worship of the sun and how it went through the three steps from superstition to religion to science. Superstition, you have faith. Religion, you have a belief. Science, you know. You know, when I go to church, I speak in so sometimes churches and like, I say, you sure you want me? <laughs> they say, hey, man, we know your work. I check you. Yeah, come on, man. And so I, so, I, so I get up to the pulpit. I thank the minister for sharing his pulpit with me. And I say, I just want to start off by telling y'all, I don't believe in God. You see, and, and see, look what happened in this room. So you can imagine what happens in high mass in church. And I said, I want to tell you something else. I don't believe in God. Mm. And then I start seeing people getting ready to do the exit. I said, but before you leave, <laughs> I know God. That's right. You can lose your faith and you can stop believing. But you get some cognitive dissonance if you stop knowing. Mm. Mm. I said, I know God. In fact, I saw God this morning. I watched him when he was brushing his teeth yes, sir. and washing his face because I am God having a human experiment. Now y'all can go. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, look, every one of your holy books tells you that. Your holy book will tell you that God created you in his image. He can tell you that he created you in her image. Because that, like Dr. Ben say, to have a God, you got to have a goddess. And so our ancestors understood going from superstition, which is their relationship to the sun, and as they studied and learned, it went from being what we call a um, superstition to a formed pattern of behavior, which is religion. And then it came to straight up science. Light and heat energy created life on Earth. And the organizing factor of all life on Earth and in the cosmos is the carbon atom. People say organic. They, they say, you know, I put my clothes, I have my clothes in an organic cleaner. What is an organic cleaner? <laughs> organic simply means that, you're, that, 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 that a living entity has assimilated carbon into a system. It, it doesn't mean anything other than that. So, I mean, I don't understand what you're talking about. Organic simply means that you've assimilated carbon. There are four, there are, there are four, basic, four basic atoms on our planet. You can call them elements if you want. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Basically, sulfur too, but basically. John G. Jackson teaches us that you can put no more oxygen, nitrogen, and hydrogen. You can combine no more than four of these atoms together. You can take two parts hydrogen, one part oxygen create H2O water. You can take two parts hydrogen, two parts oxygen, create hydrogen peroxide. But of those three, you can only combine four at a time. Well, with the introduction of carbon, that creates the billions of molecules that exist. Carbon is cosmic glue. It creates life. So even if they're looking for illegal or, or legal aliens come from outer space, they're going to look like Idris Elba. <laughs> you know, they're going to look like Amada La Negra. <laughs> they ain't going to look like Lauren Green. <laughs> because to be out in space and to survive, you must have assimilated carbon. The reason why peoples of Ure European descent or Eurasian descent look the way they look is because Africans made a mistake and went into the ice. You are a mistake, but you're a blessed mistake because nature allows you to survive that tremendous and horrendous experience of the ice, but they told you when you get back south, get with a black person. Because we didn't make you like this on purpose. This is to make you survive the, the cold because this complexion is a detriment in the cold. Yes. Because the little sunlight that we get is blocked because of the melanin pigmentation. 
So what, what are we doing it now? Right now, we are not the same complexion that we were in July. In July, we are not the same complexion that we are right now. Even our hair changes. The hair texture changes. Even if your hair is very curly, very nappy, it straightens out in the cold weather. Your body becomes thin. Heat expands, cold contracts. This is science. So Europeans are a mistake, but they're a blessed mistake because that's what allowed them to survive the cold. The way we know that is because black folk pigmented people in the cold. We studied this, we, but I've studied good studies. When we were in World War II, many of us got osteoporosis, which is bone deformation because of the cold in Russia and Europe. Because we, it was cold. And so we know that the detriment of pigmentation in the cold impacts our bones because of the assimilation of carbon. Of, uh, I'm sorry, the assimilation of um, calcium. Please, brother. Um, I want to go back to something that you said about the molecules, the atoms. According to Dr. Gabriel Oyego, who you know, there's only one atom. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, going with that theorem of goblins, oxygen being the eight, with oxygen the eight hydrogen atoms, what? How does? How is it that those those eight hydrogens come together to form the one oxygen? Atom, or, or actually, I guess it would be a compound or a molecule. Then, what happens? What, does an energy have to be infused into that process in order for those hydrogen atoms to to coalesce and, and stay together? Well, that's what fusion does. Right, but that's what, so. What hap, where, does, where does the fusion come? Where does the energy come from? Is it is it an energy that's generated out from the atoms outside of the nucleus, or does it come in from the outside? It, it, it is already contained within each atom. It has its own potential for energy. If it does what it's supposed to do, it will fuse. It has a purpose. But that's what I'm saying. If there's only one, that, if, according to the hydrogen. Theory, hydrogen. Yes. So we get eight hydrogens roaming around, and then they just, just merge together. Yeah. Well, the idea is that they merge uh, with each other. So one becomes two, two becomes four, four becomes eight, right. and, and that's the way, um, because if I was going to get into the... Yeah, there is God <laughs> Yeah, well, God, well, God is there, but what, 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 what I'm trying to get to is that this was, this was chronicled by different papyri in terms of one becoming two, two becoming uh, four, four becoming eight, and then I became one again, which shows the cycle. So what you're dealing with all the information. Um, time time just doesn't allow me to do this. This is the Shabaka stone right here. This is the Shabaka stone. But 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 what I want to get to is that part of my um, part, part of the study of this as we move through the process is to understand. Okay, let me show you this. This is the periodic table of elements. Okay? There are families and communities. Families go horizontal, communities go up and down. But if you notice, in this first family, there's only two atoms. There's hydrogen and there's helium. In the next family, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, there's eight. Next, eight, okay? This is the periodic table elements. Carbon is six. That's why they got you so afraid of six, six, six. Because they don't want they'll, they'll they'll tell you it's the devil, but that's to keep your your mind off of going there. Because they know we, black folk are afraid of the devil. So if they keep us thinking that six is the devil, we won't realize that that's a sacred atom, the carbon atom. If you put eight hydrogen, you get oxygen. Okay. If you put seventy nine, you get gold. 80, you get mercury. See, when the Moors went over to Europe, what they did is they introduced this alchemetic 
principal of the laboratory. All this Merlin, the magician, and all that, that's all black people mm -hmm. teaching them alchemy. And what the Africans did is that they took mercury, which is one of the liquids, but one of two liquids in the entire uh, uh, atomic structure, and they took one proton out, one neutron out, and one <clears throat> electron out, and they went from 80 to 79 and created gold. Europeans got caught up in gold. They said, oh, you created gold? And the Africans said, yes, but that's not what I want you to focus on. I want to show you if you manipulate those things within you, you can go from higher to lower and lower to higher. It was a metaphor for life. It wasn't about gold. But they, no, but you created gold. They said, yeah, I know, but. <laughs> but they couldn't get over it. They said, but that's gold. So what you have here is the fusion of nuclei that create various, so if you knew, if you fuse eight hydrogen, you get carbon. Seven, you get nitrogen. Eight hydrogen atoms is oxygen. But what's happening as you go through this framework, this concept, this fusion, you're creating the cosmic universe, and that's what brought the universe into being. And that's what Dr. Yibo and I are talking about in Gandhi. There is only one atom, that's hydrogen, which is what is called Plasma. You, you want to study the future? Google plasma physics. Plasma physics. Because that plasma physics is what our ancestors were doing in the laboratory that Europeans never could understand. Since we don't know it, we're tripping and not understanding what plasma physics is. Plasma is ethereal or invisible spiritual water. It is the nun. Wow. wow. Okay? And, and out of this nun, the gabut, the grand unified theory. The vibration. Okay. Here's the grand unified theory, like sort of in kind of a nutshell. In 1800s, a man named Max Planck, he studied what we call quantum physics, which is the study of the inner world from the skin in. And what he said is a neutron, a proton, an electron. He studied it, the small world, the quantum world. 1905, Albert Einstein presents his concept of the law of general and special relativity. General basically deals with gravity, special deals with electromagnetism and the strong and weak forces. But then the scientists were saying, but wait a minute, there is such a perfect formula that describes the inner world, the atomic world, and there's a perfect formula that describes the outer world. The atoms, the stars. Is there one theory or theorem that will apply to both? Because just like the electrons circle the nucleus of an atom, so too do the planets circle around their sun. There's the same type of elliptical movement in the heavens as it is within the microcosm of the body. So is there a unified theory? What Dr. Oyibo has done is he has created that theory, which is called Gabu. In science, it's called GUT, G-U-T, Grand Unified Theory, that unites the outer and the inner world. So, with that, let me go back a minute and show, re, re, remember the family that I showed you? The two, the eight? Let me show you how perfect math is. See, this is why it's so beautiful. I wish I had known this when I was 12. That's why I want to teach our children because, you, you know, spirituality is unseen science. And science is seen spirituality. It's such a math and science is so beautiful. But this civilization doesn't teach it properly. And so therefore you get lost up in the tricks. Remember the two, remember the eight. Okay, and I'm gonna show you two other numbers.
it goes the same way as the periodic table. Remember that. Remember all these families. Now check this out. This is the atomic order of the cosmic universe. Two times one squared. Two times two squared. Two times three squared. Two times four squared. Okay? You have the family of two. You have the family of eight. As you move down through this process, the next family becomes 18. The next family becomes 32. So just as the periodic table was set up the way it was, so too as it relates to the atoms. Because atoms, nucleus, and uh, the proton, which is female, then you have your first electron shell. Your first electron shell can only have two electrons. It's, it, 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 it's the KLMN shells. KLMN shells that circle the nucleus. Then you have subsets also. But the point is, is that in an atom, remember the family the periodic table of elements, okay? And then remember this mathematical equation. What you have is that the next shell, the L shell, can only have eight. In, 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 in other words, when, when you have an atom and you have, you include lithium, which is number three, the first shell around the nucleus can only contain hydrogen and helium. With the introduction of the next fusion set, you create lithium. Lithium is kicked out into the next shell because the first shell can only take two. When that other shell gets eight, the next one after that is kicked out into the M shell. So how perfect the order of operations is in the cosmos as it relates to the atomic world. And our ancestors, and this all relates back to the sun, because this is all the things that the sun is doing, and when you have a solar power energy, this is what you're doing. Now, I've, I've spent years studying this, and I'm just so sad that I didn't know this. Because, you know, this is so beautiful. It, Nature is very beautiful and, and school is wonderful and there was a time when African children were trying to bust the door down to sit with the master teacher mm -hmm. to know this. Now they're escaping school. One no truancy in Africa. <laughs> there was no such thing as a truant officer because nobody ever had to chase children down for an education. In fact, there was truant children who were trying to chase the master teacher. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. Please. Do the, why do we have um, albino children? That, that deals with, with the liver or the kidney not being able to process melanin. Okay. And the, mother, know, the mother and father process well, well, it's the inability. Al, al, you, you're, you, you're, Eurasians are a type of albinism. They're not albinoid. Because uh -huh. you, you can have children in Congo that are albinoid. You, you can have children in China that are albinoid. Albinoid has to do more with a genetic makeup than it does a, a, a particular people. Mm -hmm. But what albinism is, is what is a direct result of Africans going into a colder climate and becoming oh, depigmented. Okay. But they are not albinoid. But all of, the, all of the characteristics of an albinoid is exactly what Europeans are. Eye color change, uh, hair color change, all that occurs. So that that's out. Now you have something known as vitiligo, which is people that lose that ability. So you know they, they, they have hands that are you know you can Michael see them. Yeah. Hmm? And Michael yeah. Jackson is an example. He did have vitiligo. <clears throat> he you he could not have bleached his skin. You can only bleach but so many layers off your epidermis. Once you bleach certain, uh, you you can get lighter, but. The, the way he was, if you bleached your skin to look like that, you would have to have done a, you would have looked like you in a third degree fire. What about Sandy Sosa? Same exact thing. He's just trying to hide. He'd rather think, pe he'd rather people think he bleached than he got vitiligo. He could not become like that, scientifically. 
You, you can only peel away but so much of your epidermis. Your, your, your epidermis is so thin. And, you know, there, there are five layers of epidermis. Stratum corneum, stratum granulosum, stratum luciderm, stratum spinosa, and stratum basale. Inches, uh, uh, sections of inches thick, small. Once you start bleaching, you're, you're bleaching your skin off. It's not making you lighter. It's, it's taking off your skin. So, vitil people would rather you think they bleach than that they have a disease called vitiligo, which means the lack of processing. They're still trying to determine whether it's your liver or your kidney that is being impacted. But this is science. And I, and I know a lot of people want to say, oh, he bleached the skin up. Yeah, you know, but when you get into science, you don't get into the emotions. You know, you stay straight up with the facts and what you perceive to that date, because that, that could alter too. But, but the, the way he looked and his skin color, I, I, that, I mean, whoever did that, there's a lot of folk that would like to be white that would pay anything <laughs> to find out what he is. <laughs> Not knowing. Okay. That's at least my science. Okay, so that's that. Thank you for the question, brother, because that allowed me to expand on certain concepts. Now, here are worksheets that I use with our children and with our community when I do this class. Basically, it's introducing the sun to the children. Gotta got, got learn the sun. Parts of the sun, the role of the parts of the sun, the corona, the solstice, what's the gravity, what's plasma, solar winds, neutrinos. Hydrogen. Next one is a crossword puzzle. Again, I'm trying to get the children to know the parts of the sun. Because that's really the basic starting point to educate our children as it relates to solar power. Know the sun. Know the parts of the sun. Some quick facts about the sun. The sun's surface. And see, this is where I, I, I put a limit on how much I'm willing to admit because I don't know if they know how hot the sun is. <laughs> hey, none of them got that close to it. I do think there are ways that the future will allow us to. But I believe that, and the way in which we're going to find out about how hot the sun gets is to understand how hot we get. Because exactly what the sun does is exactly what we do. When, when you exercise, you're doing what the sun does. You are fusing your, that's why you start to sweat. Because you're doing exactly what the sun does. We are small suns. Just like God created images of himself, the sun created images of him and herself. We are the images of our sun. We have a core. And out of that core, the deeper you go into your core, the purer the energy gets. The further you get out, the more concretized that energy is. The human body is a con concretization of the human spirit. Sun activities. Have students write a diary, separate the class into two different groups. This is one of my original worksheets going back years when I was teaching melanin to children. This was the sun, please, brother. It's talking about sun, right? I spent time and time I go to NASA's website. So my question to you is, um, what I can gather at their website, they're expecting a solar flare to come off the sun. Based on your studies, uh, the sun, the solar flare that'll come off the sun, will it uh, enhance our DNA? Let, 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 let me take that concept of solar flare. There is something that surrounds the human being. It's called the prana aura. P-R-A-N-A. Prana aura. Just like you go inside dimensions to your chakras, your chakras, when they are well-tuned, emanate from the outside. And they create divisions of you. You know, in other words, if you could see your form, there's a form that comes out, there's another form that comes out, there's an, and as you vibrate on certain frequencies, you, you are able to move. Have, have you ever gotten close to someone that's given off positive energy? Yeah. And then you can feel it? Mm -hmm. That's a prana aura. Mm -hmm. 
that's a solar flare. The sun is giving off that positive vibration, Bob Marley said. And so everything that the sun does, I can see a human do. But am I answering your question is what I want to ask you. I'm looking more so uh, new, not a new word, but in this age we in this a technological age, yeah. the word upgrade get used a lot, right? So with this solar flare coming off the sun, I get what you're saying from the human body. And I'm coming from the, uh, this being a solar system, this, a solar flare coming from the sun would it upgrade our DNA uh, that would allow us to transcend to a higher level? I would say yes and no, but I would say no because I think we're doing, we have the potential to do that anyway. Mm. Nothing outside of ourselves can do anything for us that we could not do. Mm. Mm. You were born with everything you ever need to ascend into the highest realm of the cosmic reality. You have it. The question is, what are you doing within you to make that happen? Nothing outside of you do you need. You are born with everything you need, and with the relationship of the sun to you, that is a, that, that, that is a symbiotic relationship. This is why when I showed you that Aten disc, with, with, the, with the sun's rays coming down, you notice some of the hands were right and some of the hands were left. According to the, cos according to the comedic legacy, right hand gives, left hand receives. If that's true, when, the, when you see the, the right hands of the sun, that means that the sun is giving energy. When you see the left hand, the left hand is receiving the energy. We have a symbiotic relationship with the sun. And so, just as the sun gives us life, we also, as the highest manifestation of God, because remember, the original story was God wanted to know him herself. But because God was energy or spirit, can't know himself. So, the creator decided to create an evolutionary process that would create a masterpiece that would be able to reflect and to know that they were God. Make sense? And so what occurred was the planets, the galaxies, the stars, and on our Earth, because of the nature of our proximity to whatever we want to call this, there was water, it was gaseous ball. Because of interstellar space, the gaseous ball in cold space began to balance itself and created a core. Out of the core came a dynamic volcanic earthquake event that brought land up. In that, in the waters came the protozoa, the single cell. From the single cell came multicell. From multicell came plants, plants, fish, fish amphibians, amphibians, reptiles, reptiles, mammals. And then mammals started to evolve and grow. We, the masterpiece of the cosmic universe, when our hands got to the right size, our brain got to the right size, our liver got to the right size, our heart got to the right size, we no longer evolved. At that point, the Creator said, now it's time for you to involve. And so then came the search for the Creator within. That's involution. And so in finding, the process was, when I said to you, each and every one of us is God having a human experience, what I was telling you that that is the divine destiny upon which God created the cosmic universe in the first place. Because now God knows God. <laughs> and the way we interact with each other, there's only two principles in the cosmic universe. Know that you are God having a human experience and treat the Creator's creations as the gods that they are. So when you say something to somebody, your word is your body. So what if they don't know who they are? Do you still address them as you know who they are? Absolutely, because they are, they just don't know. So when you, you know, like, like, like when you address people as God, <laughs> goddess, okay, that's right. But the system has got us so afraid to be called heretics, to ever think you're God, even though it's written in the books. The moment you know you are God, you don't need the pastor to be the intermediary between you and God. 
The reason why that man making so much money up there at the pulpit is because he's convinced his flock that, yo, I got direct line. <laughs> okay, I got God on speed dial. <laughs> I got the phone, you don't. But for twenty dollars, I make that call. <laughs> so once you realize you got the phone, beyond that, once you realize you don't even need the phone because you are God, the only thing you respect, Pastor. Okay. <laughs> but, but by that I mean this. A proper church will raise its people. Like right now, for me, we in church. Well. Well. <laughs> we in church now. All right, All right so if, if, if the purpose of evolution creation is for God to know himself, to see himself. Yes. And herself. And herself. When... Everybody in the world, as a totality of God's creation, knows that we are God, looking at God, then there's no more evolution. There's no more reason for the creation to exist. The circle has been complete. No, because that's when God got to get to work. Because although evolution is, com you know, it's like if you're doing something and on a physical level there's something that you have, like if you're building a computer, you're not building the computer just for the computer to sit here. You're building the computer to do something. So once you build a computer, that's when you start working the computer. So once we got to this level, what we should have been doing and what we did back then was we was traveling in space. We were becoming one with the divine knowledge and wisdom that brought us supreme joy, bliss. So the idea was never just to know God, it was to act like God. To know that the limit you have no limitations to what you can do. And to enjoy that creation. Because in us enjoying it, the creator is enjoying it too because the creator is within us. Each and every one of us is the creator having a human experience. You know, like I tell people all the time, I say, keep on keeping on, it ain't over till we win. But after we win, now you got to get busy. You know, winning isn't the end. Winning is getting to the point in your existence where you then can move forward and produce godlike products. And at one time we did this. I believe we ascended into a seventh form of human being: Australopithecus robustus, Australopithecus gracile. Homo habilis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens. But there were Africans on the planet that became what? Homo sapiens supreme. Homo sapiens supreme or what I call super sapiens. Or Homo perfectus. And that's who we are. And we, like I said in a in, in, um, number of different presentations and also in Outer Darkness, is that the Creator came to a point in Africa where they noticed that Africans understood heaven, but they didn't understand hell. You live in heaven, but you don't know nothing about hell, so you ain't never lived there before. And so what happened was exactly that, is that God said, I'm going to pull a group of y'all out and I'm going to place y'all in hell. And come in time in history, a group of Africans were taken out and placed on the plantations. And do we know hell? We don't have to theorize about hell. We live hell. We've been there. And we beat the devil. And so we went from being, we bear the DNA of the pyramid builders, we also bear the DNA of the plantation dwellers, but God said, I'm not through with you yet, I'm going to put you all in purgatory. So he took us from the plantation and put us in the projects. <laughs> said, God, because I'm, I'm going to let a couple of y'all like John Henry Clark and Dr. Ben and Shashi McIntyre, you know, Sheikh Hunter Diab, I'm going to let a couple of them come up out of you and begin to show you who you were when you, before the plantation, what you did with the pyramids. So, but we're going to put you in purgatory first. 
So that's the projects. However, in the projects, the DNA is there. And I'm going to take you to the promise land. <clears throat> There's no human being on the planet like the African and the American Hemisphere. There's no human being that's been through what we've been through. None. There have been people that have been through some bad times. And I'm not trying to compare bad times with anybody. Bad times, bad times. Period. But ain't nobody been through what we've been through. Nobody has had the pain that we have had over time. Yet still we rise. We are being prepared for the future. We are being prepared because who better than us knows what it is to be in heaven and in hell. We know this. And it's time for us to begin to develop a relationship with ourselves first because you only have one enemy. Psychologically, we have to get out of this that the white man is an enemy. The white man is not an enemy. The enemy is that internal frequency inside of each and every one of us that continues to encourage us not to fulfill our divine destiny. That's your enemy. Your, in fact, you know, it's said, you are your own worst enemy. Everything else outside of you is an obstacle. The Eurasian is an obstacle, not an enemy. The enemy is what's in here. Once you get this right, you'll mow them down. You'll be saying, move on over, or I'll move on over you. They're not an enemy. You can see them. Look at how fragile they are. Look at that crazy 45 up there. <laughs> Look at him. Look at how he acts. He's willing to hold millions of people hostage. Can't feed you. See, I, I'm a teacher. And my salary, there were times I, in, in fact, I didn't even live paycheck to paycheck. There were times I could not pay my rent on the first of the month because of all my other bills. So I had to pay a penalty because I paid my rent late. So, so it becomes important that we understand, we know what that feeling is like to have to live from paycheck to paycheck to struggle to take care of our family. Grandma can take five potatoes and feed the community. You talk about Jesus with the three fish and loaves of bread? That's grandma. We know how to do this. We've been there. We know that thing. Who better than us? I tell black people, you know what y'all? We need to create an entire new industry. A consultant firm. How to get out of hell. Because ain't nobody better to teach that course than us. We got white people lined up for taking that course. How do I get out of Uh, so, so what I'd like to do now, which I think is very important, is I, is I just want to give you my book list for children. Okay? These are children's books regarding solar power and energy. The Sun, Tales of Invention by Chris uh, Oxley, Harnesses, Harness it, invent new ways to harness energy in nature. And now there's a graphic library system that I got from Capstone, where there's an African American scientist. Uh, he's a superhero. His name is Max Axiom. He's a super scientist. Comes from Capstone Press, Minnesota. There's 29 books in this series of this brother who is a superhero. He's a scientist. And I. Although they deal with photosynthesis, they, they deal with all aspects of science. This is like a, a, a version of, um, of um, that show that used to come on TV, uh, The Magic School Bus. But it's in book form. Well, that was in book form too. But this deals with another type of science course, where they, they have a title, Investigating the Scientific Method, that we talked about. A refreshing look at renewable energy, the powerful world of energy, the illuminating world of light, 
See, this is all that you relate back to the Aten text, and then the Aten text to solar power. So you put it all into a curriculum <laughs> so that you're educating, bless you, on um, the idea of energy, solar power, but these are the books that support your unit of, of teaching. The Attractive Story of Magnetism, The Shocking World of Electricity, and A Crashed Course in Forces in Motion. So when, so when it comes to, again, the, the, the resources that, that I present to us as a community, as to how we can begin to look at this work, it, it then allows us to, to get the children's book. And, and these are good books for us as adults, because some of us are on this level too, although we don't want to admit it. But, but, but some of us are on a level where we got to start here. Get Max Axiom for me, because when I read Max Axiom, I found out a very interesting series. I, I, I bought the whole 29 book series. Um, give or take $250 for the whole series. Uh, but if we have children in our homes, it's a good investment to put into the home. Uh, to, to, you know, to, to have them begin to uh, have them. Repeat that again. The next part. You want to know what the name of the book is? Uh, it, uh, it's Max Axiom, Super Scientist. Capstone Press, Minnesota. And so they deal with um, this story of uh, different science. All the books are good, but as it relates to solar power, these are the books that I've identified as those books that are best that, that would support uh, teaching solar power. Like I said, solar power is the future wealth of the planet. Those that get into it now create relationships in Africa and the Caribbean, understand the power of the sun, get our children to the African American farmers, get their hands up into the soil during the summertime. If they're not exposed to farms in Chicago or New York, create a, I, I was in the process of creating a relationship between my district and a black farmer that I knew down south. Because the farmers needed help and the children needed to learn soil. And so it becomes important that as we deal with these things in our classrooms, you, you can create hydroponic farms. Mm -hmm. I don't care you live in a project or not. You have a window set. You can grow plants. I, you, know, you, know, my, you know, my wife and I are growing avocados. Tina, what we call her Tina. Avocado. It's an avocado plant. And we, and we live in a co-op. And, and we got the avocado. You know, East Coast, right? East Coast, New York, yeah. Absolutely. Wow. And so I mean, you can grow in the project. If you have a windowsill and the sun comes in your window, you can grow plants. I just mm -hmm. want to add to that real quick. Um, there's some plants too, like palm plants, small palm plants that can grow. Uh, what's it called? Uh, cycads, if you're not. You're familiar with them? They need a lot of sun. As well as aloe vera. They can grow around shade plants with no windowsill. So, for example, if you have ten shade plants, like a, a peach lily, ten peach lily, and then one sun plant, that sun plant is still going to thrive and grow ten shade plants around it. Wow. That's what no sun. That's what no windows do. Or no windows, period. I mean, it can be done, and we have to get our, our our young people, even ourselves, have to get back into photosynthesis. We have to get back into growing plants. Here's my question in terms of power. If they closed all of the Piggly Wigglies <laughs> and the Croziers and your supermarkets and the restaurants at 6 o'clock, no supermarkets open, could you eat? I had a, a friend who was in the nutritional staff in the school where I was. She and her sister had a house in the Bronx, and in their backyard they grew tomatoes and cucumbers. She used to bring them in because she knew I liked salad. I, there are also millionaires with millions of dollars from Wall Street. Between that sister that had that backyard and that millionaire, those sisters had power, that millionaire had none. Because even though it's green, you can't eat money. If you can eat, you have power. If these stores close down, and that's where you got all your sustenance and your food from, you ain't got no power. Power is when you can feed yourself when everything else breaks down. 
That's probably the reason the European enslaved blacks, because they couldn't work in the fields. <clears throat> Absolutely. And their inability to be able to get back into the soil from whence all things came. You see, because economy doesn't mean money. Eco comes from the Greek word oikos, O-I-K-O-S. It's a Greek word, which is an African word. By the way. And it means environment or home. Economy, no me to know, echo, environment or home. Economy is to know your environment because remember, the earliest civilization were agriculture. And so when you knew your environment, you knew what plants to grow, you knew the time to grow them, you were able to get the best out of your land, and that was your wealth. And then you would trade with somebody else that grew oranges, you grew strawberries, they grew oranges, then you could trade. And that was the beginning of commerce and communication. And then all around the other environs, they grew other things, and so you began to trade and do business. But the Eurasian didn't have anything. So he concocted this thing called money. <laughs> Which, in our minds, gave it value. But if somebody walked up in your store and wanted a drink, and they put $10 on the table, and they said, I'll pay $10 for that. You say, but that $10 don't mean much. They couldn't get their drink because there's, you put no value on that dollar bill. <laughs> the only reason why you trust money is because you have value. And that's why all them bills and coins, what, what do they say? They pray they, don't, they pray you never learn. So what do they say? In God we trust <laughs> that you're going to believe this is worth something. <laughs> it's all a game. The value is the land and what you can bring from the land. But you don't own the land. That land ain't yours. That land belongs to a much larger force than any of us could ever be. The Creator gives us permission to work the land in order to bring forward the fruits that we need and the communications and things like that. Please, brother. Isn't this so similar to what the Chinese are doing in Africa in terms of pretending to bring resources equal to what they're taking out? Yes, but you know, the Chinese are in very serious trouble. They're, they're in very serious, they, they are on the road to extinction. And so in them going to Africa, they're trying to invest in their future. In many ways, the Chinese still have memories of African spirituality. And so they're working both sides at the same time. If they have ill intentions, they will pay a price. They'll pay a price. But no matter what, the earth is going black. Plants were born to be green. Humans were born to be black. That's not personal. That's science. It's like arguing if you saw a red plant, leaf. I mean, there's something wrong with that leaf. Nobody would say, wow, that leaf looked good. 